Today's episode is with thanks to Squarespace.com. Hello, cave dwellers. Welcome to the cave. I'm joined once again by Mark Fixes Stuff. Thanks Hello. for joining us, Mark. And I'm joined by a first, an Atari ST here in the cave. I can't believe that we've been doing this channel for so long and only now has an Atari ST appeared, or has it? Because if we rewind to this video here, which I shot all the way back in 2010, I think it was originally, when I first started the channel with the purpose of selling things on eBay and taking footage of my original collection, my first midlife crisis, if you like, <laughs> you'll see I have this absolutely pristine example of an Atari STFM, so mint, it's still in the bag, it's, it's sealed. I didn't even unseal it in the video, I sold it as was. And I've never seen an example of an STFM like that since, as minty as that ever since. And this is our chance. And it's all thanks to Mad Pete who sent this in. He donated this Atari STFM about a year ago. So sorry it's taken a while to get around to it, Pete. Um, but between us, I don't think we've got a huge amount of experience with the SD, do we? Not a huge amount. Um, my mother actually bought one, which um, I think she was going to do the household accounts on. Um, and it, I think it came with a productivity pack and um, it was in the same package as you've just shown in that video. Yes. And I think it was out for the grand total of about 30 days, then it went back in the box, then in the loft. And about 10 years ago, I went looking for that, nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. But that was the discovery pack, wasn't it? It was there? definitely the discovery was, pack, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the only kid I knew back in the day who had an Atari ST was the guy who played guitar. He obviously bought it for making music, and uh, I'm sure it served him very well because the ST has a great reputation true. for that. Now, there's one thing that always crops up when we talk about Atari STs or wherever they're talked about, and that, of course, is the Amiga. Oh, Neil. <laughs> and that's why I've got this here, Mark. My childhood money box, which today is going to be the Amiga swear jar. We need to treat the Atari ST in its own right. We need to let it stand on its own two feet. And we need to acknowledge that competition didn't only come from the Amiga. It came from a range of machines uh, in the era when this came out, 1985 originally. Of course, the Amiga was up there. I need some money to put in. <laughs> there you go. That should cover you for a few Amiga swears. Um, but there's so much more to the ST than its rivalry with the Amiga. And we will explore that starting with a history lesson now. Let's just have a few minutes of the history of the ST. What was it? When did it appear? And how did we get from the original ST to this, the STFM? What are the differences? Let's have a quick look and then we'll check the condition of it. The Atari 520 STFM is part of the Atari ST line of computers, the original ST being launched in 1985, followed in 1986 by a slightly upgraded model, the 1040 STF and the 1040 STFM, which included changes such as more RAM, that came with one mega standard and it placed a double-sided floppy drive and the power supply inside the wedge-shaped case where previously they were both external to it. This was closely followed by R520 STFM and I was intrigued as to what all of the letters in the name meant. It turns out that ST stands for 1632, referencing the system's CPU, that's a Motorola 68000, which has a 16-bit external bus, so S for 16, and 32-bit internals. T for 32, ST. F stood for floppy because we now had the integrated floppy drive in the case, and M stood for modulator because a TV modulator was added, allowing you to use the RGB monitor output port or an RF output to tune your TV into. 520 STFM. So our 520 STFM is a refinement of the original Atari ST, making it more convenient with the integrated peripherals and TV output while keeping it affordable. In terms of competition, it was really up against the IBM PC compatibles, the Apple Macintosh, and a few months after its release came the Commodore Amiga 1000, the latter two based on the same Motorola CPU. And the Atari stood out by being a low-cost machine relative to those others with some unique features, including screen modes of a higher resolution than the competition, making it ideal for desktop publishing and computer-aided design. And MIDI ports as standard. Great for musicians. At this point, there's a very, very deep rabbit hole which we could go down on the development of the ST, and I want to stay focused on our specific example, the STFM, but it is worth noting that the ST was very nearly stuffed full of custom chips. In summary, Jack Trammell, founder of Commodore originally, was ejected from the company in 1984. He set up Trammell Technology with a view to developing or acquiring technology to create a spiritual successor to the Commodore 64. In the process, 
he purchased Atari's home computer division from Warner Communications, and little did he know when he was doing that until lawyers were combing through the paperwork that Atari had already struck a deal with Amiga Corporation, a small company which included ex-Atari engineers, and they'd created a machine with the working name of Lorraine. Now the deal was that Atari would fund development, saving Amiga Corporation from the brink of bankruptcy, in exchange for exclusive access to the system developed. Trammell, who had suspiciously now developed a 68,000 based machine from scratch with the help of ex-Commodore engineer Shiraz Shivji in under six months, hmm, suspicious, would be able to graft the custom chips of Lorraine into his own design and create the ultimate microcomputer. To cut a long story short, Amiga got wind that Trammell just wanted the custom chips for his own machine and would likely lay off all of the Amiga staff once he had them, and Commodore swooped in on deadline day, writing a check for $500,000 to clear the original Atari investment into Amiga and riding off into the sunset with Lorraine and the Amiga team. Lorraine would become the Amiga 1000 and Jack Trammell's machine would become the Atari ST without the bells and whistles of those extra custom chips he so wanted. The Atari ST delivered a powerful machine from just $799 compared to around $2,500 for a Macintosh. Make no mistake, the Atari ST was a big hitter at a low price point and it would continue to develop as we'll see when we look inside. So let's get to testing repairing and exploring our Atari 520 STFM a little more and we'll learn lots more about it. And before we get to that, if you need a website, then why not try Squarespace? Squarespace make it easy to create an online presence with their library of templates to get you started, all of which can be customized to the extreme to suit the image of you and your business. Or maybe it's for a personal website, sharing your collection of big box games perhaps. You can make a shop, a blog, a gallery of retro machines, whatever you want to create for your audience. You can do it for 14 days free when you visit squarespace.com forward slash RMC. And if you make a purchase, you can enjoy 10% off using the code RMC. Thank you Squarespace for supporting the cave. Let's see what's up with this Atari ST then. And for testing, I've paired it up with this gorgeous 1986 Sony TV. It's in incredibly good condition and it's period correct for the ST. We've got a cable that goes from the monitor output to the SCART on the TV. Where did you get that one from, Mark? Because you provided that cable. I got that from Retro Computer Shack on eBay. Retro Computer yeah. Shack. Yeah, I've used them before. Good supplier. And I really love that the PSU is integrated with this machine. It keeps everything nice and compact. Yeah, I, I like it for the convenience level, but I'm not sure how warm it's going to get in there. Um, and there is something to be said for keeping a PSU separate because it can get a bit toasty. The TV's on. Will you do the honours, Mark? Oh, go on then. Ooh, that iconic Atari white screen. Is this normal or should we be seeing something at this point? I'm not sure. This is actually normal. What it's waiting for is for a disc to be put in or it will time out and the GUI will appear. Oh, right. OK. I'm glad you know. I'm, <laughs> I'm very new to this Atari business. So we've tried a few discs and then the first problem came to light. I, I want you to have a listen to this because it's a pretty nasty sound. Yeah, that is not a happy noise at all, is it, Mark? No, and also notice that the drive activity light isn't doing anything either. I'd have thought that would light up even if it was failing to read disc properly. Yeah, me too. So um, problems from the outset then, but it's not all bad news because after trying and then failing to read the disc, it did progress into the, is it the TOS desktop or the GEM desktop? I think it might be GEM. I haven't got a mouse to test this with, so I'm going to very awkwardly move the cursor over to the floppy drive icon. There we go, and it confirms, well, what we already know really, which is that the disk drive isn't working, but now we've got it in big, bold font on the screen to tell us as if the noise wasn't enough. And I think it probably means that it's time to take the lid off of this thing and have a look inside. That will give us an opportunity also to get more familiar with what chips are inside and powering the STFM. 
After taking the screws out on the underside, we can just lift the lid off. And you want to be careful disconnecting the keyboard because the cables are incredibly brittle, as I'll find out shortly. Now there's a lot of metal shielding in here and that's pretty standard for micros of this period. More screws to come out to lift that off, some longer than the others, so you need to make sure you keep a note of where each screw goes. And then there are these bent metal tabs which just need to be flicked out to allow the shielding to come off. Do be careful though because it's, it's quite sharp. And we're going to want to service that disk drive of course, so that can come out. That comes straight out of the case without having to remove the shielding which is quite handy. And we'll put that over to one side for Mark to take a look at. Uh, you're going to want to lift the whole thing out of the case before you can get the shielding off the system board. And that opens up to reveal the system board under that shielding. So what I suggest we do now, Mark, is if you want to take a look at the repairs on the disk drive, I'll get clued up on what's in here and we'll come back for a tour of the components when I know what I'm talking about and we'll see how you get on with those repairs. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so looking at the underside of this drive, we can see some of the usual suspects. That's right, bad caps. What you'll often find with bad capacitors is that they've leaked. Over time, the seals have given way and the corrosive fluid runs out onto the board. Before you know it, the capacitor starts to restrict the flow of current. There are two surface mounted electrolytic capacitors on the bottom of this drive. Just looking at the layout of the PCB, I suspect they're responsible for power to the drive and spindle rotation. If these fail, then the drive won't be able to spin up and it will fail to read any disks. Let's check the ESR or equivalent resistance of this removed cap. And the 4.7 microfarad cap is so bad that the tester can't even read the capacitance. It just knows that the resistance is more than 40 ohms. Yikes. The 47 microfarad cap well, it fares a little better, but out of spec at around 37 microfarads, with a whopping 21 ohms of ESR. Let's clean up the pads and get the new caps installed. I just need them to be as clean and flat as possible. First the cap at the power input. I add a little dab of liquid flux to aid soldering here, and then I solder the part in place using 6040 rosin core solder. I could have used solder paste and hot air for this, but for two capacitors, well it's not really worth getting it out of the fridge and waiting for it to warm up to room temperature. This smaller cap is a bit trickier because the replacement is an X size up, but it's still suitable. Looking at the keyboard connector, as soon as I moved it I could see that the wires were frayed and near to snapping. This computer has been taken apart a few times and the crimped wires into the fixed header are in a bad way. In the end the best option is to take them all the way off. Then I stripped the wires and used the header crimps as solder cups, adding some solder and slipping the tinned wires back into place while the solder was still molten. We lose a little length, but the outcome is much, much stronger. Meanwhile, I've been taking a look at the system board and here's what I found out about the 520 STFM. At the bottom here is the Motorola 68000 CPU. On this machine it runs at 8 MHz, which is the same as the original Macintosh and about 13% faster than a stock Amiga 1000 or 500. In your face Amiga. Here we can see 512K of RAM is installed and the space for 4 more chips, so they would have been populated as standard in the 1040 model, giving it 1 meg, just the half a meg here. I wonder if we can just drop some more in or if other modifications are needed to make that work. Something to look into when we upgrade the machine. There are no fewer than six ROM chips here containing the operating system which is called TOS. Atari originally intended to use a 68K version of the CPM operating system from Digital Research, but complications resulted in them porting GEMDOS instead. 
So TOS comprises of GemDOS with a GUI, GEM or Graphics Environment Manager running on top of it. So we have a CPU, we have RAM and we have an operating system. Another chip to note is the Yamaha YM chip. This is the audio chip on the ST. It's an interesting choice in that it's quite lacking. It could be argued that the SID audio chip in the much older Commodore 64 is a better chip than this, or even the Pokey in the Atari 8-bit machines. I suspect that this chip was chosen primarily because it was a low-cost option. However, the ST is famous for its MIDI ports which have nothing to do whatsoever with the sound chip, but could control external audio devices. As every ST has MIDI ports as standard, it became a workhorse in music studios, catered with software such as Cubase and Logic Pro. So onboard audio a bit lacking, external options exceptionally well catered for. Then I noticed something quite interesting. There's a space here for a blitter chip. Now blit is short for block image transfer. It's what allows you to transfer large blocks of memory very quickly. For example, copying video memory to update the screen. A dedicated custom chip to perform this task frees up the CPU to be doing other things and so helps performance greatly. What Atari have done here is create a space for just such a chip and then failed to supply it. The Blitter chip wouldn't materialize until Atari released the STE model, that's E for enhanced, which included the Blitter chip, more colors, a PCM audio chip, and lots more besides. So the range would eventually get all of these things, but the STFM just teased us with them. This Blitter space is apparently present on the later STFM boards and absent on the earlier ones, so I guess we have a later model. And in this box we find the shifter, one of four custom Atari chips, yes it does have some, and the shifter controls the video screen and colour. The glue, MMU and DMA chips are the other three custom ICs Atari made for the ST. The remaining components are very off the shelf, and there's nothing wrong with that. It works. In less like ours, it doesn't. Let's see if it's any happier since Mark paid it some attention. Well, okay, that loaded a lot more quickly than last time. It did. It's triggered the GUI to pop up almost instantly with no disk grinding noises this time and a window which appears to contain the contents of the disk. Although I did notice that the drive light still isn't coming on, so that needs some more looking into. Yeah, no drive light at all. You just can't get the staff around here, Mark. All right, stop moaning and load a game. <laughs> OK, OK, so on this disk, which is a cover disk from The One magazine, is the demo of Pipe Mania, a really frustrating oh. puzzle game that I happened to own on my Amiga back in the day. Oh, Neil, we're <laughs> going to be absolutely skint. We're going to be in a poorhouse before we finish this video. <laughs> well, the good news is that it seems to be working fine, and it brings us around to a really nice point, I think, to consider what to do next with the machine. It does still need some TLC, and these are really good clean. Some of the keys are really quite yellowed, so I think some retro writing will be on the cards. And it's typical, after all of this sunshine, today is the first day in weeks that it started to rain, so we'll have to schedule that in <laughs> when the sun makes another appearance. But the good news is that it's working. Yeah, and that's all we care about right now. We've got a working ST for the exhibition, and that is a good result. So it's been a really interesting episode for me, as it is every time you get to take the lid off of a machine that we've never got to look in before. I hope you've enjoyed exploring it with me as well. Mark, did you learn anything new from uh, meeting the Atari ST? I learned everything new. <laughs> <laughs> everything was new. I'm, I must admit, I did, I did do a bit of cribbing before we filmed this episode, sure. and I looked on the internet for some of the more common faults, and the things that came up were power supply, Yep. and it wasn't a problem in this machine. Um, on the drive, it was the drive belts, there was no drive belt in this machine. Um, but the thing that struck me the most was the operating system, both baked into the machine, but baked into six EEPROMs. So that must have been quite costly to manufacture back in the day. And if there was a cost saving to be found, Atari would have found it. Absolutely. So it must have been out of necessity. I think they squeezed it down to fewer EEPROMs later in its lifetime. But um, yeah, interesting find. And it's not the end of our journey with the Atari STFM because we now want to upgrade it and we're just as unfamiliar with upgrades as we were with the machine at the start of this episode. We don't know where to go next and we're reaching out to you in YouTube comment land. What do you know about the Atari STFM in terms of upgrades? What do you recommend? What's the latest and greatest things that we should get in terms of, do we need more RAM? Is there a hard drive option? 
Do we use a floppy emulator? What's the best way to get the very most out of this system in terms of games, in terms of productivity applications? Because I want to explore them as well. Yeah. And we have got a high resolution monochrome monitor, which would be fun to play with, with desktop publishing and uh, MIDI music creation and things like that. Of course, we're going to have to plug something into those MIDI ports. Absolutely. And see what it's capable of. Um, lots more to explore in part two. But to kick that process off, we'd love to hear from you and your advice on what we should put in there. So get commenting and uh, we'll start buying the bits that we need. Mark, thank you for joining us and helping us to fix this up today. Are you going to join us in part two? Absolutely. Excellent. The journey will continue. Thank you all for watching. And as always, take care and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.